Beethoven wrote thousands of songs, but we only know about 60, you know, or 20. But it means you have to go through this many, many times, and you have to have the quantity in order to have the quality. So, so you can always improve upon your business model because what worked five years ago may not work five years later. Hi, and welcome to the Entrepreneur Organization Business Podcast. I am your host, Lynn Panetti. Please meet my guest today, Sophie Su, an Australian race expat who has been living in Beijing with her family for 15 years. She started a company, Pinko Space, eight years ago as a place for children to develop creative and critical thinking skills, as well as explore their own passions and potential. Now, in today's episode, you're going to learn how to pivot your business and thrive no matter what challenges you're faced with. Whether it be product fit to economy or political changes that could affect your business, learn how to apply critical thinking and become a pivot master and be fearless in business. So please join me in welcoming Sophie. Welcome to the show. How are you, Sophie? Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, such a privilege to have you, actually. Ever since I met you at EO, I'm like, oh, my God, you're like my sister from another mother. (laughs) (laughs) And, yeah, so you came from EO Beijing, but now you're in Sydney. But, yeah, I really wanted to bring you on because you've got such an interesting business. And just the fact that you were able to start in a different form and to where it is, I really thought that we should talk about the topic of actual pivoting, you know, how did you pivot in business? So tell us, uh, tell the audience a little bit about your current business and what it was like at the beginning. Yeah, sure. So originally I found the need in the market to provide skill sharing, a skill sharing platform. So you could hire people for their skill sets, whether it be teaching a musical instrument, teaching a language, or teaching how to do drag. We did have that even. So we, I created an app and we had about a thousand experts in their area, dancers, uh, you know, journalists. So I launched this in 2015 and in China and it got funded, et cetera. But after about a year and a half, we realized that the business model was not right. And we had about two or three months cash flow left. So we were either going to continue or or quit and do something else. So I talked to my co-founder. I said, how long are you willing to do this without get being paid? And then so we both wrote on a piece of paper and we both wrote the same number. We both wrote six to 10 months. We would, mm-hmm. we would keep going and not get paid and not have any employees and try to work it out. So that's what we did. And we, so pivoting is... I think for me, it's basically failing and trying something else, right? And obviously there are things that are good with the old business model that you can bring into the the pivoted model. So every time we pivoted, we've looked at what works in this business model and let's take the things that do work and then work on that. So even in my, we, so we do, so after we, the the first model of of the skill sharing, we realized Let's look at our customers who are booking these people. And, and it was really surprising. So it was mostly parents booking it for their children to learn these skills. I guess in China, it's kids like to, you know, they like kids to, you know, do tutoring and learn and uh, be, be, you know, a jack of all trades and learn like four languages. So they put a lot of emphasis on that. Whereas adults are so busy working, they don't have time to go get a guitar lesson. So we go, okay, so 80% of our clients are parents for, for kids. And how old are these children? Six to 14. So the age where they don't really have to like do so much schoolwork, but they still have time to explore their passion and to explore like what they want to do. So we go, okay. And then Out of the thousand people who are on the app, maybe like 300 of them provided a really good service that was, that was sustainable and that the clients booked often and gave good reviews. So we obviously, it was like a gig economy. Everyone's based on like their feedback and reviews. So we, we narrowed it down to about hundred, a hundred individuals. And we basically decided to work really closely with these hundred individuals and develop a, a package or, or a plan for them to really teach those skills, kind of like masterclass. This is before they had, there was masterclass. But in my mind, it was something like the, the masterclass that was on. So getting these people to 
uh, write down exactly what their curriculum would look like and what people would get out of it. So we did that and it worked really well. And But we still thought there was way too many skills. And we had to make sure that all the skills were quality controlled. So then we narrowed it down even more to just 50 individuals. And, and we still work with a lot of these people and, and we developed camps after school activities and obviously online classes. So all these things with the same DNA of skill sharing, but on a more structured, sustainable level. So one of the things that we use as a methodology to teach our kids is called project-based learning. I don't know if that's common in Australia, but they say, you know, just to give an example, like chat GPT, open AI, that is going to replace a lot of jobs. And the top 10 qualities from the World Economic Forum for a person to thrive in 2023 is the number one thing is being able to solve difficult problems. So critical thinking, creative thinking, that's something that robots can't do, right? It's it's used to be like teamwork and things like that. That's very low on the on the hierarchy now. So we like to use pro, uh, criti the critical creative process to teach our kids, whether it's camp or whatever. But I also use the same technique in my startup when I pivot. So just to, you know, have a takeaway, I'll just share that what, what project-based learning is. Tell me more about the, yeah, your actual process and how you actually get, become more cr critical thinkers. Yeah. Yeah. So basically there was a guy called Graham. He was one of the founders of the London School of Economics, but he was also a sociologist and he wanted to do something incredible, which was he wanted to write down or jot down why people became excellent or brilliant like for example Beethoven so he he documented Einstein you know people throughout history and try to see if he could codify the the creative process of being brilliant or excellent so he did codify that and it's now called the there's different names but basically the critical creative process and if you think about it every single startup begins with this process and and it keeps going in cycles that's why I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't see failure is because it just is a cycle right you go back to thinking about the preparation stage so the first stage is preparation so this is when you do research or you're sort of you find that there is a market need that needs to be fulfilled or satisfied and then you start you know, re researching and, and, and trial and erroring and seeing if this is a business model that will work. So this is called the incubation phase. And then after that, you have trial and error, you, you think you've got it, then it, it's called illumination. So the aha moment or when the, when the light, you know, literally <laughs> light bulb moment. So aha, it, this is going to work. And then you go into evaluation. So is it really working? Do the clients like it? Will people come back and pay? Will there be a natural organic growth? So uh, with a lot of people who get investment early on, it's because you're, you're, you're burning money and it's not a natural organic growth. So I was lucky that I, you know, we burnt out the money. <laughs> so we were really relying on natural growth. And when there's a natural growth without doing so much marketing and, and everything, that means you have, you've got something right. And you need to find a way to duplicate that, that model. And then obviously that last stage is implementation. So it's, it's where you go work, 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 because you already, you, you got it right. So how, how, how can I scale now? Or how can I make this product even better? So that's like about pivoting, but that's the process that we take kids over and over again to doing. Yeah, I love that you, you've you applied it for your own business, but now you're also teaching kids. So tell me more about, okay, as a kid, what, you know, I have kids myself, like what are they inclined to be like if I didn't teach them this skill set? Like what, what are yeah. they defaulted to? So, you know, in China especially, there's a very linear way of learning. It's like input, output. So I tell you, 
this is what you're going to learn and you don't think anything else. These are the answers, right? I guess in, in Western society, kids have more of a critical thinking space because people allow them to have a voice. In Chinese classrooms, there's like 50 kids per class. And if everyone put their hand up once, that's 50 minutes gone already. So there wouldn't be much time. So you just don't have a voice. It, it's just logistically impossible. So what we do, because we are an, a, a, not a school, but we have the luxury of providing desirable way to, to, for these kids to you know, foster these skill sets. So what we do is we have different, uh, it's like a cake, right? We have different tiers. So the ultimate tier is to go, Lynn, when you're, before you finish high school, you, you know exactly what you're good at and what you're passionate about, and, and you can pursue that in university or in your future life. So we never think of education as a short term thing. We always think, how are we going to foster them so they're successful adults? So they're happy, successful, working in a field they're passionate about. And often like Asian children, they get put in a box. We all know that, be this, be that. They don't even have time to think about what they want to do. So my process is helping them discover A, what they're passionate about, and B, what their strengths are. So sometimes they're different. Sometimes they're the same. Yeah, but we yeah. try to see if there's alignment. And we do that through projects. So for example, the older kids, they would have one, one of the projects was build a restaurant for your neighborhood, right? So, so this is a real problem. They had to research what, what demographics lived in their neighborhood, what was lacking. Maybe there were a lot of um, expats and they wanted, you know, Western food, for example. So then they would go about doing the research and seeing if, you know, people would actually go to this restaurant, if this is a need. And then they would actually create a prototype of, of the restaurant and including a menu, including how, like cost analysis. Uh, and then they would, they would see if, if this is viable. And we would do a thing at the end called Shark Tank, where we, prov I have a lot of friends who are <laughs> yeah. restaurateurs and they would see if they would invest in it. Yeah. Um, and if they, uh, do you, yeah. Is your program in Australia at all? Because I mean, I would love my kids to be signing up to this. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm in the preparation phase, which is I'm seeing if that model also works in, mm. in the West, because is that something that kids do need here? You know, that's something I'm wondering. And recently. Yeah, I mean, considering Jack GPT, you know, exploding, I, we no longer have to really think. I think no matter what country you're in, you really need to prep your kids up with this yeah. critical thinking. Now, I just want to go back to the pivoting of your business side. What is the difference between pivoting and quitting it's like how do you know when this yeah. particular field should be given up altogether or do you believe that it's really about really holding on to one part of it and pivot because that's probably going to give you more success than trying to throw everything out yeah so like we all know that starting from scratch is like the hardest thing with with no data with no you know so I think firstly do you love your team that you're working with? Like my co-founders, I really like, he's the opposite of me. He's like an IT geek. So <laughs> he's great at math. He's the, you know, he and I really compliment each other and I would choose him again if I started a new business. So I want to move forward with this person firstly. And then secondly, there's always things that you have learned from your experience with failing in the first round that you can change for something better. So we don't want to waste the failure. You know, we want to, you know, uh, elevate it. Yeah, I, I think that gives us a, a better chance. And I feel like I've gone through that natural journey, although I've actually tried multiple businesses in completely different fields. And I think it came down to me chasing the money rather than really chasing the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm going, what is an industry that is going to make money? So you go there, you do that. But then if you truly go back into what do you like to do that will keep you going? Mm -hmm. You actually kind of stick to what you know, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll just continue to, to we'll go through this. I don't even want to call it pivoting or, or what, just call, going through this cycle again and again. You know, Beethoven wrote thousands of songs, but we only know about 60, you know, or 20. But mm -hmm. it means you have to go through this many, many times and you have to have the quantity in order to have the quality. 
So, so you can always improve upon your business model because what worked five years ago may not work five years later. Yeah. So you really have to think about what, what can I do now? So you don't think like you're not stuck in the past and you're not living the future because a lot of entrepreneurs are also living in the future. So you're saying like going through this process again and, and validating it and seeing if it's still valid and it's still a good model. Yeah, yeah. And then whether this model would be applicable in other countries. Yeah, that's right. Now, I know you don't have the solution to everything right now, but I know that living in China or having a business in China can be challenging. Just love to hear from some of your insights. Not that I need you to even solve it right now, but I love for people to just see the kind of challenges that you face that you will have to find a way for. Because, you know, we're lucky in Australia, not much things actually change, you know, as much as we complain about the government, it's quite chill, nothing bad really, really, really happens. So yeah, I guess I, I, cause I've had a coffee with you and when you shared some of these things, I'm like, wow. And what are you going to do about it? You know, so share a few of those interesting changes that's happening in in China. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of my friends in in Europe, in the U S they always want to tap into the Chinese market because there's a lot of growth there and you, there is a large population. There's rapid growth. Like When I first started the app, I remember I had 70,000 followers and they were like, we're not even going to look at, that's not even a number in China. (laughs) It's like, you know, you have to, it's just times 10, like the number of followers, the number of products. So it's just on a larger scale, everything is. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity. And, but also you have to think about like, for example, I was, you know, Western social media is, it doesn't work in China. So there's no Instagram, Facebook, there's LinkedIn, but a Chinese version. And, you know, all the, all the things that you're used to doing marketing on. So you have to really pivot your, your mindset into like, where are the Chinese audience looking? Where are they? And so it's a very, very different market space, but You know, I do know a lot of successful expat entrepreneurs also in China because you also have the edge because they're not critical creative thinkers. So, you know, you can get in there and be quite unique in the way you design your product or the way you service uh, customers. Yeah, but I, I think when you, if you ever do a SWOT analysis in China, it's like the threat, you don't even know what the threats could be because Recently, Lynn, this is after I had the coffee with you. China just announced that they, the four large accounting firms, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte, they're all not allowed to work in China anymore. (gasps) So just like that, just like that. So we all know that these four accounting firms, because they're so reliable, because of their auditing, before companies go public, they you, even Chinese banks, that all of the Chinese banks use these four accounting mm. firms. But the mm-hmm. government thought that they need to use local accounting firms and they need to be more transparent with the data. They don't want their data being leaked because when Overseas. you audit a company, yeah. you know everything about oh, the company. Yeah. So they decided, hey, no more. So you can't renew your contract. You can finish your contract, say if it's for another year, but then after that, there's no renewals from a month ago. So that means everyone who works in these accounting firms and they make a large amount of profit globally, the the Chinese branches, Mm. uh, because Chinese companies are going public, right, left Mm. and center. The most, the fastest and most companies going public, I think are in China. So that was where the business is. So a lot of it is policies and, you know, you have to really do your due diligence and seek expert advice in your industry. But even if you do, and then one day they just... Anything could happen. Because, I mean, you were telling me how they were reducing the English teaching because they don't want people to be learning English and leaving. They don't want you to do tutoring all of these things yeah. what it's telling me is that because you've grown up through all of this I feel like your resilience level is just on another planet you know like for us you know when COVID happened we're like oh my god we're so not used to this change I'll say it's probably the only change I remember growing up with but what has it taught you as a person how do you feel internally as you know your character or your strength having gone through experiences living in a place like China like How has that changed you as a person? I'm not, firstly, I'm not afraid to fail (laughs) because it's, 
it's just like a part of the process like how many light bulbs did you know did they have to That's make it. before the first one lit up right so it, you you can't see failure as a bad thing so that's the first one second one is i think because i'm 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 preaching to the choir i'm teaching this process to my kids to, to our students so you have to live it and breathe it to teach it so i think if i'm saying you know just go back to the preparation and incubation stage to them I also have to really believe that because you have to look at life as a holistic experience, a journey, and not not one incident can sort of make or break you. Mm. Oh my God. It's just, I guess I'm even hearing, you just feel frustrated for you. You know, I feel like, why can't it just be the way it is? But you've learned to the point where you've just embraced it and kind of see these, to me, major changes as just, part of business <laughs> so yeah. it's a completely different level so I guess how could we uh practice that thinking we don't live in China we don't get exposed to this kind of thing but what could we say to ourselves or do to that to make us feel you know a lot more prepared if anything like this could ever happen to us yeah because you know COVID for three years you know who knows what the future holds for us as, as human beings. And there's so many things you can't predict, but there's one thing that you can always have is the mindset. I think the, what I was referring back to the creative process is how can you think critically? How can you jump outside of the box again and again and retackle the, the situation? I think if you know that it's a circle and not a straight line, I think it's much easier to go oh yeah, we're just back to this point and uh, we're going to come back again. And it's never ending. I don't think you can just say, yep, I have the right business model and that's that. And I'm just Mm going to stick with it and and I I can retire. And unfortunately it doesn't work. Everyone has to try to innovate. You're right. You don't know the journey because when I was, when we were going through the COVID, we were like, oh my God, panicking. But it ended up working really well for our business because we're already online. It worked well for a lot of my corporate friends who work in professional places and they're so grateful now they get to work from home. So it's like going through a challenge like that made us think negative, but really we we didn't see the the finished picture yet, which ended up being, a, a, I guess, a blessing to some people's lives. Absolutely. And so many new innovations and ideas, you know, actually spring from, you know, bad situations, <laughs> not what we think. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, what would you like the world to remember Sophie for? I hope that we can have more adults that know what they're passionate about in life and pursue that because you know a lot of us go from school uni and then job to job and then finally if we're lucky we find something that we're passionate about and we can do for a long time and it makes us happy I think being an educator I think that is what I want to be remembered is these students that have come out of our program have done that and they can be truly happy and successful individuals I love it. I love that you're working with our next generation. I mean, I've got kids, so it means a lot to me to have someone like you in life to do that. And you're definitely teaching how, us how to pivot and not be scared. So thank you so much, Sophie, for being on the show. I make, I'll make i make sure that all your details are in the description below in our YouTube channel. And so, yeah, once again, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs>